Ten, 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 ten. Is that is that a Superman theme? Well, anyways, I'm back, and you guys are back too. Welcome back, guys, for another episode of the Daily Show, where we talk about interesting, fun facts, trivia for everyone's daily knowledge. And I'm your host, Jr. As if you guys still don't know that, this episode is for December 9. In case you don't know that part, um, for today we're gonna be talking about christmas cards in general when was the last time you made a christmas card or bought a christmas card a lot of things are uh, can be bought now and sometimes people don't want to put effort on making you know like something as simple as a card uh i myself is guilty of that so i'm not i'm not i'm coming out clean <laughs> you know i would rather uh buy a card and because it all it already has like uh a message and then i'm just gonna have to add a little bit uh but yeah we're, we're gonna talk about christmas cards we'll also talk about uh pastry all kinds of pastries you know like that will be considered or that will be uh included for that observance for the pastry um, and then we're gonna talk about taking care of pets yes um and then for our history we'll talk about the end of a viral infection yeah well we're not talking about covid obviously we're still having some problems uh or we're still having some issues to you know dealing with it and uh and um just recently i heard there's a new variant again so a lot of people are just you know uh just really just really wanted to uh get this over with you know but you gotta do your part you gotta do your part uh to stay safe and for the people around you to be safe um, and then we'll travel again to Belgium to visit an awesome landmark. And as usual, we have our uh, mini theme for the stuff of the day. Okay, let's get the cameras rolling. Get, let's get the show on the road. Today's observance, again, the first one is Christmas card day. Now, first of all, let's uh, talk about the history. So Christmas cards and the man who is credited for coming up with the uh, concept for a commercial Christmas card, uh, his name is Sir Henry Cole, um, are celebrated today. So for this observance, we're talking about the product that he made uh, famous and the person who came up with the idea, which is, uh, that was Sir Henry Cole. Uh, because he didn't have time to write all his family and friends uh, at Christmas time, Cole, uh, who used to be a worker at Public Records office in London, commissioned artist John Calcott uh, that spells as C-A-L-C-O-T-T. -T. Uh, John Calcott Horsley to design a card for him. Um, which Horsley did while living in Orstone Manor in the United Kingdom. Um, this first card, created in 1843, had a picture of a family celebrating Christmas together while drinking, uh, flanked by images of people giving food uh, and clothing to the needy. Below and then below that uh, picture, there was a phrase uh, that says "A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to you." So it was inscribed. Um, as the cards worked well for Cole, he had a thousand, uh, thousands of them printed, um, which were sold for a shilling each. Now, shilling is the uh, the currency, the the former currency in the UK, um, making them the first mass-produced Christmas cards. Now, fast forward to 2001, one of the original cards, which was signed by Cole himself, fetched over $30,000 at auction. Uh, as of now, I'm not sure how many of those original print, the very first original print, uh, I don't know how many of those survived, but at least the one that they have, one of the original ones that was signed by Cole um, himself, it's $30,000 for a card. And here I was getting all thrifty, you know, saving up some money and uh, making sure I don't go past $5 for a card, you know. Um, it is believed that about a dozen of original cards survive today. So again, it's it, it's only believed, okay? But nobody really know exactly. Um, none of them can be viewed at the national, or one of them actually, not, not. One of them can be viewed at the National Art Library inside the Victoria and Albert Museum. Uh, which is a museum where Henry Cole was the first director. So if you wanted to um, see what the original, what the very first official Christmas card looks like, 
well, first of all, you can Google it. But if you have the chance to see it in person, then you can visit, you know, the um, National Art Library inside the Victoria and Albert Museum. Um, by some accounts, by the end of the 19th century, many Christmas cards were being poorly produced and contained overly, uh, you know, overly sentimentalized images. Uh, but quality artistry began to rise again as competitions held by card publishers gave cash prizes for innovative designs. So they, they kind of like held a you know, small competition, a contest, uh, best art that, that could be showcased in uh, Christmas cards. And then at the same time, um, or in the mean meantime, technology continued to improve as well. And cards began to resemble photographs. Um, the range of themes increased and included subjects such as sports, landscapes, patriotic drawings, uh, and, uh, and other things. You know, I mean, there are some funny Christmas related um, cards out there now, too. You know, like uh, there are some, like, uh, something that will have an art and a pun, you know, related to it, like kind of like an, a, a joke, you know. Um, Christmas cards became so popular. That they began to be collected and each year they were reviewed in newspapers similar to how films are reviewed today um, by the late 1920s about 40 factories employed roughly 5,000 workers in the christmas card businesses or christmas card business in the united states uh, of course if we're talking about cards uh, we should be talking also about hallmark right um, in 1915 Hallmark published its first Christmas card. Uh, they adopted the format of four inches wide, six inches high, uh, folded ones, and made to be inserted in an envelope. I mean, if you go to Walgreens and you know, you know, you kind of are rushing, or CVS, I guess, you kind of are rushing to get some cards. Not even Christmas cards, you know, just cards in general. And then you look at the back, uh, it would say it's about like 90% that it would say Hallmark. Um, this is the format that became the standard, the uh, uh, four inches wide, six inches high, and then you know, fold, folded ones, you know, that became the standard and by the 1930s and uh, for the next few decades, popular cards of this type regularly had red suited Santas and stars of Bethlehem on them. Hallmark commissioned cards from Salvador Dali, Grandma Moses, and Norman Rockwell um, their 1977 card, Three Little Angels, is the most popular Christmas card of all time with... Here's the reason why. It has 34 million cards sold. The Three Little Angels card right there. Uh, throughout the 20th century, Christmas cards became even more popular as they were tied to charitable giving. You know, by the 1940s. Uh, many nonprofits were raising money to sell cards or buy selling cards. Uh, the most well known being the UNICEF or the United Nations Children's Fund, uh, which raises money for children around the world who need or who need things such as clean water, vaccines, and other necessities. Um, the first UNICEF card was issued in 1949 and was drawn by a seven year old. Uh, <laughs> I kind of have to pause there because I have. To pronounce this properly uh, Czechos see I, I didn't even pronounce it right uh, Czechoslovakian girl there you go whose village had received assistance from UNICEF following World War II uh, today children still design UNICEF cards by participating in a contest just like you know like the uh, competition that we talked about a while ago uh, to have the best looking card or best looking picture that could be imprinted in a card um, and you Professional artists also donate images for UNICEF cards. So that's pretty awesome, right? Um, now, if we talk about the tradition, uh, the tradition of Christmas cards continues to change in the 21st century. Um, because again, technology and new printing methods allow mass produced custom cards. And now, you know, we started seeing like uh, fancier ones. <laughs> I, well, I, I'm saying fancier ones, but. Um, um, more creative i would say like uh, cards that are more creative like pop up right and then they would have some um music when you open it there's gonna be like music in uh included in the card already i mean it's 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 just a loop of a part of a music but 
that was that was something awesome. That was something awesome and new that was that were added in uh, in the cards. Um, if, and even though we're talking about Christmas cards, uh, I'm talking about just cards in general. You know, um, <clears throat> holidays such as Hanukkah and Kwanzaa uh, now have cards also made for them as well. Um, emailing instead of mailing cards and quickly creating cards on a computer have both gained in popularity um it's i think it's what you call an e-card um so an e-card is ba basically a, a a digital card you know uh but w w since it's a digital card and you use a computer like an um, let's say an email you know you send it via email um it's digital you, you can do way more animations way more designs to it. it it could be more interactive too you know um but that's a different format of it's not a physical type of card like if you print it it's not going to be as animated <laughs> as when you when you have it uh, via email um <clears throat> so more people are abandoning christmas cards or christmas and holiday cards altogether that's the Kind of like the downside of physical cards you know like like i said we're we are kind of uh, well not kind of we are actually going to this direction where we have this awesome technology that could pretty much do a lot of things now and that includes communication like communication is one big thing so instead of you sending a physical card that will take days you know a quick email with some fancy designs and stuff is is good or not good it's, it's way faster like um that means you can actually send in the same day of the holiday um but for me uh i'm a little bit sentimental person so i would rather receive a physical card because for me it again for me my opinion it feels like it has more effort if you send a physical card especially if that card was um uh, was i mean there's a message in there um that was added if you know I, i'm not talking about just like the default message that was in the card but if there's like a, a handwritten message in there that was added in the card yeah um i, I would i would rather receive those than just a regular <laughs> like christmas gif you know when you say gif like the animated pictures and stuff and that's not even a card right so yeah um still though well even with that not so good news about the the future of christmas cards or cards in general holiday cards um, americans purchase about 1.6 billion christmas cards each year so i don't think from from what it looks like from what it sounds like i don't think it's gonna you know the physical christmas cards going anywhere you know i don't think it's gonna it's gonna be extinct yet so that's a good thing all right um oh anyways uh let me know in the comment section below what when was the last time you actually put an effort in making a christmas card because it's about christmas cards for today's observance and i guess while you're i don't know while you're uh thinking of what you're gonna be writing <laughs> on your christmas card maybe uh, a little bit of pastry could help you think you know yeah, get you some energy and uh have your brain think about a very sentimental message uh, next observance national pastry day um, observed th this observance was observed since the mid 1990s and presumably started by cd kitchen national pastry day celebrates pastry doughs and all the big pastries that can be made with them um, the uncooked pastry mixture known as the paste or pastry dough consists of a flour water and shortening which is made up of solid fats and sometimes also sugar um, oh, I mean, sugar, milk, baking powder, and eggs. You know, those are the kind of like the main ingredients, right? Uh, it may be sweet or savory and has more fat and less water than bread dough, uh, which makes it more crumbly and flaky after cooking uh, than its counterpart. Uh, cooked pastry dough is light, airy, and fatty, but strong enough to hold a filling. Uh, some cooked pastry doughs are phyllo or phyllo, sorry, Filo pastry, puff pastry, flaky pastry, uh, yeasted pastry, uh, what else? I mean, there's a lot of pastry. Short pastry, there you go. Uh, short sweet or, or short sweet pastry. Right. I mean, you, you know what I mean. There's a lot of, of of pastries out there. Some common examples, though, are some common examples of pastry uh, 
are uh, these pastry doughs you are used to make are tarts, pies, uh, croissants, you know, uh, cheese Danish or, or Danishes, okay, and baklavas. Oh, by the way, I remember one of our friends on Discovery, uh, Donna. You know, she makes an amazing baklava or baklava. I think <laughs> I think I mispronounced that one too. Instead of baklava, I think it's baklava. There you go. It was it's it's also a dessert, but it's so it's so rich that you're you don't even have to have a lot like it, it, you could have at least just this size and it, it's it's rich in flavor and it's sweet so a very small serving should be more than enough um, as far as the history is concerned the pastry was first made by the ancient Egyptians who wrapped a paste formed of flour and water around meat uh, to soak up its juices while it's or while it cooks the ancient Greeks Romans and Phoenicians uh, made pastry similar to uh, phyllo. Um, the pastry uh, that developed in the Middle East was brought to Europe by Muslims in the 7th century. Okay, and it wasn't until the mid 16th century that pastries became more widespread and recipes be uh, began appearing in Europe. Then, uh, flaky and puff pastries became common there in the 17th century. Now, my question to you is, what's your favorite pastry? Yeah, that should be an easy one, right? Unless you have a lot of favorite pastries like, like me. Uh, I like pastry. So what is your favorite pastry? Leave it in the comment section below. Or maybe you can tell me on Zoom, you know, once we meet up again on Zoom. And then for the last one of uh, today's observances, we'll talk about the uh, International Day of Veterinary Medicine Day. There you go. Uh, it's a vet medicine, not not veteran. Uh, veterinary. There you go. So, even if this observance emphasizes about medicines for animals, right? We'll, we'll you know in general we'll talk about the practice of treating animals. Now, the practice of taking care of animals and preventing and curing diseases that uh, kind of makes them sick uh, goes back all the way to the Neolithic period. Uh, which contains the first recorded evidence of a cow that had undergone uh, trepanation or trephination. You know, it's uh, a type of skull surgery involving the drilling of holes to treat injury and pain. Now, we're talking about ancient time, like, a, well, not even ancient time, but like a very uh, long time ago. Um, so, as far as technology and the, the, the methods, uh, you can say they're they're a little bit more barbaric you know instead of a, a cleaner approach but i mean re reality speaking you know um uh, the, the science behind medicine uh under underwent a lot of revisions and and uh and and changes significant changes you know uh, make things uh, easier practices uh safer and stuff like that but of course, along the way, um, you know there were there were wrong moves along the way because that's that's uh, that's how us humans um, learn. You know, we learn from our mistakes, um, and, and obviously we're not perfect. So we're gonna we're gonna make mistakes along the way. Uh, but I guess the most important thing is to learn from them uh, so that we 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 try to prevent it or we try to avoid whatever negative outcome may happen and at the same time improve uh, imp improve from what uh, whatever existing method or practices that we currently have right we we, we 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 strive to improve and learn from our mistake to do better basically there you go um <clears throat> Oh, I'm sorry. I kind of moved on my <laughs> moved my script right there. Accidentally scrolled it. Uh, all right, horse doctoring was one of the first organized veterinary profession professions to emerge in the Arabic world in the ninth century because of the economic and military significance of horses. Well, we all know uh, that history proves that horses are one of those uh, one of the best companion animal companions that we had. You know, when it comes to um, tr transportation that's mainly you know transportation um, uh, cargo uh, uh, 
you know, having wagons and stuff like that. You know, the like horse is our go-to when it comes to our transportation. Uh, the horseshoe makers or farriers of London were even encouraged by the Lord Mayor to form a fellowship. Ooh, fellowship. <laughs> it's like uh, Lord of the Rings. <laughs> In 1356 to improve their practice of tending to horses so yeah um i'm gonna say like the, the horses became uh uh lucky i guess they because they were the first uh type of animals that were uh being treated because of uh because of uh, because of their benefit to us so yeah and eventually um the practice of of taking care of animals um curing them you know um helping them uh, with their health expanded to more than just the words like you know like now we got the pets for our dogs uh for you know farm animals you know and and even like specialized ones that uh like for for lizards for example right and insects there you go so for today i'm not sure if you would know someone who is a vet uh veterinarian <laughs> not, not not veteran um but yeah they are doctors uh, for animals um, which is still uh, not not still but which is an amazing um, field of science medical science there you, go. you might want to thank them and greet them for today if if you know someone who's a vet alrighty moving on to our today in history now I did say that we're gonna be talking about the um, the official date well not official date but like the um uh eradication yeah the eradication of a viral infection and that is the smallpox right there so in 1979 just you know a few months shy of uh in uh, of 1980 um actually not a few months uh, i mean today is december 9 1979 it's basically uh the end of 1979 right uh just few days few weeks few weeks before 1980 before next year uh a commission of scientists declared that smallpox has been eradicated wow it it took a lot well you can say it took a long time but uh you shouldn't be we shouldn't be looking about uh we i mean we shouldn't be looking at the the like how long it takes because the most important thing is that smallpox is gone it's like bye bye smallpox you know like it's eradicated the disease which carries around a 30 percent chance of death that that is pretty high uh percent percentage you know for those who contract it is the only infectious d disease afflicting humans that has officially been eradicated now something similar to smallpox had uh, ravaged humanity for thousands of years with the earliest known description appearing in Indian accounts from the uh, 2 century BCE. It was believed that the Egyptian pharaoh uh, Ramses V or the fifth, Ramses V died of smallpox in 1145 BCE. Uh, however, uh, recent research indicates that the actual smallpox virus may have evolved as late as 1580, uh, 1580 CE. A type of inoculation int introducing a small amount of the disease um, in order to bring on a uh, mild case that results in immunity was widespread in China by the 16th century. But um, hopefully, this same uh, event, um, uh, this same amazing event uh, is could happen <laughs> to our current uh, situation right now because I know everyone is just uh waiting you know everyone's just asking when will this end now that we have another uh variant uh going on uh, this feels like it's gonna be here forever but i would encourage everyone to stay positive do their best uh to stay safe and uh, encourage people around them to be safe as well you know and healthy and happy and stay positive and we'll, we'll get through it guys we'll get through it all right, next up, we have another event today in history. Uh, in 1992, the separation of Charles and Diana was announced. Now, British Prime Minister John uh, Major announces the formal separation of Charles, 
who was the Prince of Wales and their heir to the British throne, and his wife, Princess Diana. Uh, Major explained that the royal couple were separating amicably. Um, the report came after several years of speculation by the tabloid press that the marriage was in peril, citing evidence that Diana and Charles spent vacations apart and official visits in uh, separate rooms. I mean, I understand the royalty and all, but I just can't imagine the pressure uh, from from these two individuals. Um, you know, like a, a lot of people are actually watching your life and uh, good thing I'm not a royalty. <laughs> I just want to say that. Yay, I'm not a royalty. <laughs> um, okay, so um, on July 29, 1981, nearly 1 billion television viewers in 74 tuned or 74 countries tuned in to witness the marriage of Prince Charles and uh, Lady Diana Spencer, a young English school teacher. Uh, married in a grand ceremony at St. Paul's Cathedral in the presence of tw uh, 2,650 guests. Uh, the couple's romance was for a moment, or for the moment, the envy of the world. Oh my gosh. So, I mean, I, I don't really watch TV around that time. Well, I'm I wasn't even alive at that time. I wasn't even around at that time, 1981. Um, but imagine a lot of people, like millions of people, billions actually, sorry, billions of people uh, watched you get married and then billions of people also witnessed you um, you know uh, getting separated it's just it, it's too much you know I, at least for me it's too much I'm not, I don't want to be like I, I don't want billions of people to know what my private life is it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of sucks but uh, unfortunately that's kind of like uh, a royalty thing you know that's why I, <laughs> I guess I'm saying that I'm thankful that I'm not a royalty yeah, even so you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not even fit to be a royalty. So, <laughs> all right. So we got uh, notable figures born today. Let's start with Mr. Clarence Birdseye in 1886. He was born in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, best known for developing a process for freezing foods in small packages suitable for retailing, uh, Mr. Birdseye or Birdseye revolutionized the modern frozen food industry. Uh, he was working for the U.S. Biological Survey as a field naturalist. Um, he got the idea when visiting the Arctic. Birdside noted that when frozen fish was thawed uh, much later, it later retained most of its freshness. As a skilled businessman, um, he co-founded co a company. It's called General Seafood Corporation, and he founded or he co-founded co it in 1924. Um, which started the entire frozen food industry. So he's the starter, you know. And then in the 1930s, he patented a new food dehydration process, which he began marketing in 1946. So uh, it's thanks to Mr. Clarence Birdseye that we got some frozen, uh, fro frozen, <laughs> frozen food, or at least a good process for freezing foods, you know, by uh, retaining the, uh, the the freshness of the food. All right, next up, 1902, we have Miss Margaret Hamilton. Uh, she was born in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, she is best known for her portrayal of the Wicked Witch of the West in Metro Goldwyn or MGM's uh, classic film, the, the, can you guys guess? The Wicked Witch, come on. The Wizard of Oz, there you go. The Wicked Witch of the West was eventually ranked number four in the American Film Institute's 2003 list of the 50 best movie villains of all time, making her the top-ranking female villain. And then, um, I believe this is our last notable figure born today. We have Miss Grace Hopper. Um, she was one of the first programmers of the Harvard Harvard Mark I computer, which was used in the war effort and the Manhattan Project from 1944. Hopper went on to invent the uh, first compiler for a universal computer programming language. Um, she is also credited with coining the phrase debugging, you know, the word debugging. Um, you might not be familiar with that, but it's it's a computer term. When you say debug, you kind of like find where the error is, you know, bug, uh, debug, right? Um, and usually uh, when you say a computer bug, 
uh, even though its origin was a physical bug in one of the uh, tubes before because you know computers before they became uh, suitable for your your office or your bedroom or as small as laptop they were really big they occupy a whole room and so that means their their wirings and cables are also thick where, where physical bugs can come in um, so again she is also credited with coining the phrase debugging after removing a moth with tweezers from a relay and taping it into the log so that's that, that's what i was talking about you know like before before we even uh consider the word bug uh something digital in in the computer terms you know um the literal literally computers before little will have bugs like like real bugs in real life you know like for example this one uh she has to remove a moth right Owing to both her accomplishments and naval rank, um, she was often referred to as Amazing Grace. The USS Hopper, a bird class, uh, class guided missile destroyer, was named for her, as was the Cray XE6 Hopper Supercomputer. There you go. And those are our uh, notable figures born today, together with some events in history we're moving on to the place of the week and we got belgium so we're gonna go actually to the capital city of belgium and it's called brussels uh, being the capital city and one of the largest hubs of great museums palaces chapels and mansions uh the city city uh brussels is one of the most popular places to visit in belgium um this is also the administrative capital of the European Union and pulls tourists from different parts of the world. Uh, famous for world-class cafes, pubs, restaurants, and uh, shopping arcades, uh, Brussels offer a plethora of options to make your European holiday enchanting and exciting. And also, or last but not the least, there are various Brussels sightseeing options in Belgium too. For all kinds of travelers that won't disappoint so what are you waiting for let's travel to brussels no i don't sound like a very convincing uh travel agent now yeah let's take a pass on that <laughs> all righty uh last part of our show today stuff of the day we're gonna start with the animal of the day disney version and we have miss Ursula, there you go. I believe some of our students uh, actually are big fans of uh, this villain in the animated film, The Little Mermaid, right? So as you can see, her top part uh, or her upper body resembles a human, um, but lower body resembles an octopus. And that's the animal we're going to be talking about, an octopus. Ta-da! <laughs> Ta-da, an octopus. So, an octopus is a sea animal with eight arms or legs. Or they're not really arms or legs. I would say tentacles. There you go, tentacles. Uh, there are more than 150 species of octopus or types. Um, they belong to the group of animals called... We we did it on our Zoom. It's Sarsalar M. Mollusks. Right there. Um, in that um, animal uh, type or group... In that animal group, it also includes the squid. You know, they're kind of like the cousin, Rel close uh, related animal, um, but they're not the same. They're not the same. Uh, clams also. Clams, oysters. Main difference is clams and oysters. They have uh, uh, shells, and they are called bivalves. You know, if you wanted to have a subcategory of mollusks, um, octopus or octopuses um, live in seas throughout the world an octopus has a soft bag-like body and large eyes its long slender arms or again tentacles uh, reach out in all directions each arm has two rows of cup-like suckers um, with great holding power and as far as their size um, they vary greatly in size they can be as small as about just, you know like an inch or two um, and then the largest would be 18 feet or even like 30, 30 feet, you know, and we're talking about like the tentacles too, you know, if they are straight. So they vary in sizes. And of course, it has something to do with how deep 
uh, they live in the ocean. Because um, of course, the the deeper you you the, or the deeper the animal lives in the ocean, of course, the more pressure they would feel. So, um, in order for them to compensate for that, they need to have a uh, a body that can sustain the pressure. There you go, and also their size, right? Um, if you still don't know, or if you haven't heard of this, which I doubt it, an octopus can change color quickly depending on its surrounding or its mood. So they can, you know, they can change from gray, brown, pink, blue, even green or, or red, you know. Uh, so they can be moody. <laughs> they can be moody. Uh, an octopus usually crawls along the ocean bottom on its arms or I keep saying arms, tentacles, there you go, searching for food. It may, or it eats mainly crabs and lobsters. Um, there are also octopus um, that are very skillful hunters. I mean, generally, they're all skillful hunters, you know. They also attack large prey such as sharks. Um, if an octopus is in danger, it shoots a jet of water out of its body. Uh, this moves, or this uh, move actually makes the octopus uh, move backwards very quickly. You know, it's kind of like a jet uh, force. Um, yeah, so that's what we have for our animal of the day. This is version octopus. Now for our fall version plant of the day, we have the fennel. So uh, for most, including me, fennel isn't really a common household ingredient. Um, although it does emerge more during the fall as its season lasts from mid to fall or to early spring. Uh, both the crunchy bulb and the seeds of the fennel plant have a mild uh, licorice-like flavor. Um, fennel and its seeds offer a range of health benefits including antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and antibacterial properties. So, uh, long story short, uh, they have good properties that could uh, help you stay healthy. Fennel. All right, so musical artist of the day, we have Jose Marichan still and uh, forgive me because I forgot to actually uh, put his picture there instead because again um, I usually put the, um, the the album cover and this is the album cover for for his CD so he, I kind of feel bad because you don't you, you don't know what he looks like so I will look at, look look for his picture it's not gonna be an album cover anymore for the next time we talk about his uh, one of his songs because he we're going to be talking about him for the whole christmas season for the whole december and for today uh we're going to be mentioning his song give me your heart for christmas the same album christmas in our hearts in 1990 there you go and Guys, I actually encourage you to listen to his songs, uh, his, his mellow voice and uh, very calm musical arrangement is perfect for Christmas nights, especially if you're by your uh, by your chimney or uh, not chimney, I'm sorry, by the fireplace, there you go, by the fireplace or just in front of, uh, a, you know, in your, in your living room and enjoying uh, some hot cocoa or... Uh, other kinds of drinks for Christmas. Um, eggnog. There you go. All right. For our uh, word of the day, 12-letter word, right? So we have onomatopoeia. Now, I have to spell it for you guys. It's O-N-O-M-A-T-O-P-O-E-I-A. Again, the word is onomatopoeia. I have to say it slowly, but if you want to say it fast, onomatopoeia. There you go. It is a noun, okay? And it means uh, it, it, the formation of a word from a sound associated with that name or with, you know, how, how it was named. Like, for example, uh, the perfect example here is when you when you read, like, the old comic strip or I guess even new comic strips, they still have them, you know, like, you don't have, uh, you don't have any way of drawing the sound so instead you use onomatopoeia like pow like if someone you know like like it, let's say if batman if batman punches the 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 bad guys right it's gonna be like pow oh actually speaking of batman uh they used to have a batman tv show with robin right batman and robin and uh uh like the old version of batman and robin so when they like when they when they fight the bad guys they have the autumn 
onomatopoeia on screen like kapow zap pow boom like like that those are onoma onomatopoeia <laughs> see I'm, uh, I'm getting my tongue twisted now so yeah that is our word of the day and lastly or last but not the le least least uh uh, I gotta have to say that again. <laughs> last but not the least. There you go. Uh, our Christmas trivia. Um, you guys know that Coca Cola played a huge part in Santa's image, like that that picture right there. You know, so before Coca Cola decided to use his image for advertising, or this image for advertising, Santa's looks uh, tended more spooky than jolly, actually. Then in 1931, the beverage company hired an illustrator named. Haddon Sundblom um, to depict the jolly old elf um, for magazine ads. Now, kids see visions of sugar plums instead of having Santa themed nightmares. Yeah, there you go. Well, I think that's a good idea. You know, kind of make a plus, it would just make sense because uh, Santa Claus is based from St. Nicholas, and you don't want, you know, you, you don't want. Uh, Santa Claus looking scary than, uh, than than happy or jolly, right? Because that would reflect on uh, Saint Nicholas too. So, yeah, I'm saying that's our uh, Christmas trivia, and that is the end of our show today, guys. Let me click on it. There you go. Hope you like it. Hope you learned something new, and uh, do not forget to leave your thoughts about the topics we discussed in the comment section below. Uh, I would really love to hear your thoughts about it. If if you don't have any accounts or if you can't uh, leave your uh, wh whatever you want to say in the comment section below, you can all we we can always talk about it in our uh, Zoom daily Zoom. You know, uh, we'll, we're always on Zoom between 8:30 to 11:30 in the morning and uh, 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. in the afternoon. So if just in case you guys are missing out or not sure what our schedule is. Hey, our students, you guys are in now, all right? But anyways, I have to say goodbye. And uh, what? See you later. No, see, well, yeah, see you later, I guess, all right? <laughs>